About a month ago, I booked a flight across the country to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to see the Steelers take on the Rams. I bought myself some black and yellow camouflage and drank with the locals, and I shouted obscenities at Mason Rudolph from Section 533 just to blend in as much as possible. It was honestly an awesome time, and seeing Heinz Field light up in the fourth quarter when Renegades started blaring over the speakers was an experience I'll never forget. But during my trip, I did get a lot of comments asking me what the hell I was doing out there in the first place, especially since I'm a Texans fan. Why would I fly all the way from 75 degree California to 30 degree Pittsburgh and turn myself into a Yinzer for a day for no reason? What was the point of it all? And the thing to understand is, my whole purpose for that trip was to witness something special that I can't see in Southern California. I wanted to watch with my own eyes an NFL franchise fight and claw and gut their way to a win despite having every excuse not to win. I wanted to see how they did it and how they seemingly keep doing it no matter the odds every single week. And truth be told, when you do see this Steelers team up close and personal, the energy is different, and you kind of start to understand why out of all the good teams in the AFC this season, this is the one that just absolutely refuses to die. There's something unique and something rare about the Steelers this year, and at least to me, the reason why this team is still going is the unique and rare superstar that they traded for all the way back in week three, Minka Fitzpatrick. Now, I'm not one to solely lean on statistics when I do deep dives like this, but every single number that I've pulled off of Sports Info Solutions databases, the absolute most comprehensive stats out there that I can find, they all show the striking difference that Minka has made for this team. Before Fitzpatrick was acquired, the Steelers were 24th in yards per play allowed, they were 27th in first down percentage allowed and touchdowns allowed, and tied for dead last in interceptions with zero. Since week three though, when he entered the lineup, every single basic defensive metric has skyrocketed. The Steelers now lead the league in takeaways and they picked off 18 passes in their last 11 games. They've allowed the third lowest yards per play and the fourth lowest first down percentage. And they're also now second in touchdowns allowed and second in sacks despite that slow start. Everything about this defense is better and they've only gotten more dominant as the year has gone on. Hell, half Lamar Jackson's interceptions and nearly a quarter of all the sacks he's taken for the season are just from one game against the Steelers' defense. Jackson picked apart New England and LA and Seattle and played mostly without mistakes against the Niners and Bills, but the Steelers? That defense chewed his ass up and spit it out all game long, and Minka's addition to this roster was one of the main reasons for that. Let me explain how one guy can make such a huge difference though, because his impact is more subtle than you think. Early in the year, pre-Fitzpatrick, the safety position was a massive weakness for the Steelers. Every other safety on the roster, for whatever reason, just kept constantly making mental errors, they were slow to process things in front of them, and they kept doing my biggest pet peeve of them all, as someone who studies a lot of great defensive backs, they played passively. They would back off so much because they were so afraid of being beat deep that they let everything in front of them be completed. And I mean everything. If you wanted a little 15 yard post right at the hashes, it was yours for the taking. There was nothing they were gonna do to stop you. If you wanted to work the middle of the field against cover three, you better believe that would be wide open too. Everything was made easy for the quarterbacks on their schedule, like Tom Brady and Russell Wilson, and it drove Mike Tomlin nuts as a former defensive backs coach himself. So he resolved to fix that problem early in the year by going out to get one of the most aggressive DBs in the entire league to be his new free safety of the future of course referring to Minka Fitzpatrick. Now, Minka, he plays different than all the other safeties on the Steelers roster, and his style is the kind that Tomlin desperately missed since the retirement of Troy Polamalu five years ago. You see, Fitzpatrick, like Polamalu, doesn't go backwards unless he absolutely has to. He will literally plant himself at about 12 to 15 yards past the line of scrimmage, and he'll sit on any route going over the middle. It doesn't matter if it's cover two or cover four, or if he's dropping down into one of their cover three robber looks that they love to run so much. He is not happy unless he's moving towards the ball at all times. And while yes, sometimes his propensity to not back up can leave this defense exposed to deep balls, Generally, Fitzpatrick's mindset is that he knows he's got a great pass rush in front of him, and he knows that the quarterback knows that he has a great pass rush in front of him. So if that QB wants to hold the ball long enough to take a shot over the top and punish him, that's fine. He'll let him try it, but it's probably not going to go well. So Minka trusts his corners to make up enough ground to break that deep ball up anyway without him when it spends so much time hanging in the air and the quarterback is throwing under duress. 
Fitzpatrick's entire goal as a free safety is totally different than a lot of other free safeties around the league. He's not going to get all of his big plays on overthrown passes 40 yards down the field, or at least most of the time he's not going to, because those 40 yard passes are the hard ones, the low percentage balls, if you will. And a quarterback might only try three, four, maybe five low percentage passes like that per game at most. The higher percentage passes though, the post routes, the crossing routes, the digs, the 15 yard curls, all of those intermediate throws that are quote unquote safer, those are what modern passing games really prioritize. Pretty much every single passing concept in every single playbook is gonna have at least one route that works to a 12 to 15 yard depth, which means every single play is an opportunity for Fitzpatrick to come forward and get the ball. So, knowing that, why would he restrict himself to just being deep all the time and not being targeted? When you look at it that way, his unsafe style of playing safety kind of makes a lot more sense, especially when he's got such a dominant pass rush playing in front of him. He's gonna gamble a lot and he's gonna bluff a lot, but he also knows that most of the time you won't have a good enough pocket to call his bluff and punish him anyway. It's truly a perfect fit for what Mike Tomlin wants his defense to be. I think the aspect of his game that might be the most underappreciated though, beyond the obvious raw aggression, is just how smart he is and how great of a communicator he is. That was also something that was sorely lacking for Pittsburgh early in the year that Fitzpatrick fixed pretty much overnight when he got there. When I saw this defense live back in November, with no camera cutaways and no commercial breaks, I was able to just sit in my seat and focus on all the things that you don't really get to see at home like how the defense talks to each other on the field and how they adjust in real time. Minka's not just special because he's explosive and because he's got terrific ball skills, he's special because he's smart. If something has success against his play style, he will go out of his way to communicate and adjust everyone's responsibilities around him so that it never has success again. I'll give you an example from the Chargers game all the way back in week six. It was late in the third quarter, the Steelers were up big by 24 points, and the Chargers were just about to start on their big 17 point comeback run that eventually made this game a lot closer than it probably should have been. And the biggest reason why the Chargers were able to start scoring so quickly so late in the game is that they figured out how the Steelers match zone coverages worked and they began to exploit them while also exploiting Minka. A match zone, by the way, for those who don't know, is basically a zone defense that uses a lot of man coverage principles to match up with receivers in their individual routes. So for instance, on this 14 yard gain to Keenan Allen in front of Fitzpatrick, the Steelers were in their cover six match zone look, which is like a hybrid between a cover two and a cover four, hence cover six. Now in a cover six, you've got the short side of the field from the hash mark where it's more condensed and there's less space for receivers to work. So that side uses basic cover two principles like a corner staying home in the flat, a linebacker walling off inside to play the hook zone and the safety dropping back conservatively to play that deep half. That's all cover two on that side because they can, but then on the other side of the field, the wide side, they use more match cover four principles because there's more space to operate for receivers and they don't wanna leave those huge open holes in between traditional zones. Now, when I say they match those routes to not leave the easy stuff open, you might be wondering exactly what that means. How do they match routes in man coverage from zone? Well, they do it by playing what's called a box technique, which is a predominantly man coverage principle. And in a box technique, you can kind of just picture each defender on that side of the field taking one quadrant of a box. You've got the nickel corner playing the first route that comes to his quadrant, the low and outside release. You've got the inside linebacker playing the first low and inside release. You've got the boundary corner playing the first high and outside release. And finally, Minka Fitzpatrick himself as the free safety playing the first high and inside release. Everyone's got their own area of the box to cover and they basically treat it like man principles to the first receiver that comes into their area. So that's how they match every single route and follow them around like it's man coverage, but from a zone alignment. Match zones are a really good, solid way to play defense if you want to avoid giving up cheap receptions in between traditional zones, but they're not without their own weaknesses and eventually the Chargers found those weaknesses. In match zone, as long as you know the techniques that the secondary will play to match those routes, meaning triangle technique, box technique, etc., all the different ways they can actually match up, you can go into a play knowing ahead of time which DB is going to end up covering which route, or which DB will be drawn away from a certain area of the field by a certain other route. 
match zones are predictable in that way. And they often take a defender's eyes off the ball because they're so focused on just picking up whatever receiver comes into their area. So on this big game to Keenan Allen, they use Pittsburgh's match zones against them by making them predictable. They knew that as the high and inside defender in that box, Minka would be locked in on Mike Williams first coming into his area. And they knew that if Minka locked in on Williams and turned to run with him, even just a little bit, it would distract him long enough to sneak Allen in as the second man into that high and inside area on that dagger concept. And they could exploit that for an easy first down. Obviously they did it and obviously it worked and even Fitzpatrick after the play was tapping on his chest and saying my bad to all of his teammates because he knew that the Chargers got him on that one. But because Minka is Minka, he's smart enough to know that the Chargers would eventually come back to that same dagger concept again when they needed to and when they inevitably did it, he would make sure that he was ready. So the next quarter, after going over that coverage bust on the bench with his teammates and making adjustments, you started to see the Steelers play their match cover six a bit differently. Now, instead of a straight box technique with four defined areas of the field for four individual defenders, they played sort of a hybrid box technique, kind of, with the nickel corner, Mike Hilton, now having to carry his low outside read to the high and inside read and beyond it. He was no longer just going to sit back in the flat and let Minka be responsible for two guys at once because Fitzpatrick had him carry that receiver for him down the field so that he would not have to bother turning and running with it and instead he could go back to focusing on being aggressive and jumping that route to the second man in his area, the dig route, that was once again coming right at him. It was a brilliant adjustment by Minka. It allowed him to still play his aggressive style without having to compromise himself by covering multiple receivers at once. And despite the fact that this interception was dropped, it was one of the best examples that I've seen all year by any team on how to adjust in the middle of a game to something that beat you. And they do this all the time. The Steelers defense, and especially Fitzpatrick, are always learning and studying and growing every single week. I mean, hell, there are some routes that Minka jumps out of nowhere that don't even make sense at first because it looks like he's just guessing. But with a guy like him, when he looks like he's guessing, mostly it's just him already knowing what's happening on offense before the ball's even snapped. There was one pass breakup that I saw live in Pittsburgh against Cooper Cup, where even today, I still can't believe he made that play because it was just so damn good. The Steelers are in cover four here down in the red zone, or at least their match zone version of cover four, where it's basically quarters on the back end with man underneath. And Minka's responsibility as a quarter zone defender inside is to help out Joe Hayden by giving him an inside bracket on whichever receiver releases deeper down the field. So for instance, if Josh Reynolds widens Hayden out by stemming outside and then breaks back inside away from Hayden's leverage on like a post or something, ideally Minka will be sitting right there to help him out and jump that throw. Those are just quarters coverage principles in a nutshell. And you can see Terrell Edmonds and Steven Nelson playing quarters exactly that way over on the other side of the field. But Minka's not going to play quarters here. He's gonna leave his assignment right out the gate not give Hayden that inside bracket, and he's gonna come all the way from deep to jump a shallow cross to cup on a mesh concept. When I first saw this play on film, my jaw dropped because he's not even supposed to be there. He's not supposed to read mesh that fast, let alone jump it from that spot. That's just not how cover four works, but he did it anyway. And once I saw this play, I decided to go on a quest for myself to find out how he knew to do this, because instinct alone doesn't make you jump routes that fast. I went through every single Rams offensive snap for the entire season leading up to this game because I wanted to see what Minka saw. I wanted to know why he jumped that route that quick. And after all that tape study, I eventually found this play. This is also from week six, a full month before that Rams Steelers game. And this play is the only time all season the Rams have run that same mesh rail concept to Cooper Cup from this formation on any down, any distance, from anywhere on the field. I'm talking one time all year and this is it. It's the same exact play with the same rub on the shallow crosses over the middle and were it not for Fred Warner being an absurdly talented football player in his own right, there's a good chance it would have been a touchdown. Minka saw this going into their game against the Rams and he knew that if it were a man coverage situation or even a match zone coverage situation where the rub routes could do some damage against man coverage principles, he would be useless sitting back deep and watching that play unfold. He decided right then and there that if he saw Cup line up in a stack, leveraged outside in the red zone, he would have to jump that route. 
He made a choice not to wait around. He chose not to just let the plays come to him, and instead he was going to go to them, and it worked. He broke up this pass on third down, forced a field goal attempt instead of a potential touchdown, and he helped his offense keep a lead that they desperately needed from start to finish. This play in a huge game that they had to win is Minka personified. No second guessing, no being passive, and no fear of being the aggressor. After studying everything that Fitzpatrick did to win that game and help the Steelers claw their way back into the playoff hunt, this is the first time ever that I felt like Mike Tomlin has found the true heir to Troy Polamalu. It's the first time that he's found a new, unbelievably smart, incredibly athletic, and borderline reckless one-man turnover machine. In my opinion, from the day that Fitzpatrick stepped foot off the plane from Miami, he's been the most valuable player on the entire team. Don't get me wrong, TJ Watt is phenomenal, and Duck Hodges has started to reignite a dormant offense that desperately needed a spark, but if you ask me what has really been the source of the Steelers' turnaround this year, it's Minka Fitzpatrick. When the game is close, when there's barely any time on the clock, and when the towels are waving and Renegade is booming, there's only one guy that the city of Pittsburgh can always turn to. One guy that every Steelers fan can count on to make a play. He is that rare special talent that, against all the odds, has saved a season from the brink of collapse. If the Steelers keep trending the way that they are, and if they make the playoffs after beginning the year 0-3, it might be time to start talking about the trade for Minka Fitzpatrick as not just one of the best trades of the year, but maybe one of the best trades ever. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode. And of course, thank you to our sponsor, SeatGeek, for helping to make it all possible. Ironically, I used SeatGeek to buy my tickets to that Rams Steelers game like a month ago before they even approached me for a sponsorship. So I've already used them before and I can vouch for them, especially because they were very clutch because I was very lazy and I didn't even buy tickets until after I landed in Pittsburgh, which uh, is a terrible idea if you want to, you know, not stress your wife out a lot. But yeah, it still worked out. Uh, I did find last minute tickets to be fair to myself and it was an awesome experience. The app was really easy to navigate. I downloaded it and I got the tickets in like five minutes in my Uber on the way to the hotel. So it was really easy. The price was great. I think it was like 70 bucks each, which for a Steelers game in Heinz Field against the defending NFC champions is pretty damn good in my opinion. So I've got zero complaints and I'm saying that as an actual paying customer for multiple games this season since then. So if you're thinking about going to any games this year, maybe even trying to catch one in Heinz Field while you still can because their home game against Buffalo this weekend is the last one of the season there. All Film Room viewers get 20 bucks off their first purchase with promo code BRETT. Their link is in the top of the description. You can click that, download the app. It only takes a few seconds. And again, promo code BRETT will get you $20 off your first purchase, no matter what those tickets are for. So again, thank you to SeatGeek for sponsoring the show. Uh, and as for me, I want to let you know that I've got another episode coming out this week on the Bills who are playing against the Steelers on Sunday night. I figured I'd put the Coleman curse to the test and see what happened when I did two episodes on teams that were playing against each other because I'm sure that I can't curse both of them at the same time. Or maybe I could and they'll just end up in a tie or some bullshit like that. But I guess we'll find out what happens for science sake. Maybe a meteor will hit the stadium or something at halftime. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I'll be back later this week with that Bills episode. And uh, until then, later. <laughs>